My name is Jane Ellis and I live on Trundy Road and I just want to say that as a taxpayer and parent I put all five school board members in their position in hopes that they would listen to myself and also uh, the students and the parents which I don't think they really have. I call it a, a lazy decision. They were tired, granted they've done a, a nice job at times but I think that they got lazy and they were tired and it was a real easy cut. I know myself representing the faculty at the town council meeting that was held in the cafeteria at the high school when you um, okayed the um, portables and you said you still need to cut, 50, I think it was $50,000, I went over to Loretta Pond and said, as I said, representing the faculty, because there was a lot of faculty there, and said to Loretta, we as faculty can come up with $50,000 please give us a chance, please have a forum between the faculty and the school board members. And she said to me, what a good idea, Jane, I'll get back to you. I did not hear a thing about it. We could have looked at our budgets and come up with that money. Not only that, but it would have given the school, the whole system, an opportunity. And I know in the history that I've been here, I don't think it's ever happened, an opportunity to work together as a total school system for one goal in mind, which would have brought the system closer together. That did not happen. I also question, I know myself as a teacher, I always say to my students, if you have an issue that you believe in, get your facts straight and present it and act like an adult if you want to be treated like an adult. And I question what lesson we teach when the students all got up and walked out and the parents represented at three or four different meetings over and over have come out, crowded this place, crowded the uh, cafeteria and it still doesn't seem to make a difference. I question the lesson that we learn um, to the students because to me it's festering um, apathy in the students and what a shame at such a young age. So I'm asking that, I think it's also a shame to have to ask for money to, to be raised for such a um, needed middle school program and with such a good response to it. But that is what I'm asking, if that's the only way that it can be reinstated. I'm not coming here as a teacher. I'm coming here as a parent. I have a fifth grader who I do want him to have home economics next year and in seventh and eighth and for all the other students I see what the program has done for many students and I don't think that the school board can ignore that um, when there's so many parents and students that support one program and I think that needs to be looked into. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward? Want a brief rebuttal? Right. Some, some additional history that I do not have prepared remarks for. I have to share the concern uh, of, of, Penelope, of Penny Carson on the appropriateness of having to do this. Uh, as a boring actuary by profession, being in the public eye and doing anything is anathema. Uh, I've improved my public speaking, I suppose. I'm taping this to see how, bad, how badly I do actually look. But I share the concern that many people would have about a, an ongoing basis. This would be, I would agree, that it would be totally inappropriate for an ongoing basis. I think what has happened, at least in my view, and I do not have a vested interest in that I've had a child who has gone through the program and enjoyed it, and I have one that eventually get to see, well, may go to sixth grade and seventh or eighth, may have the opportunity and I'm fighting for his future opportunity to have that program. But as I, uh, as I pursued this, or I, as I contemplated this, we would not have gone forward at all if the school board hadn't at least informally said we'd reinstate the program. The real issue is money. If the real issue is money, one makes an effort to raise money. We raised, we're working to raise, the public uh, statements have been to raise $51,000 to reinstore, reinstate all the cuts. No one has been solicited saying, if you, your 100 will go to home ec, or your 100 will go to IA. So parents are doing this blindly. At least 150 or 60 people have pledged $100. That's 
a modest vote. I wish I could have had them all here tonight to speak. We would have been here till two or three in the morning. Uh, but perhaps we at least can listen to the fact that 160 people have, in fact, ple uh, pledged some money. Why I'm pursuing this, at least on a personal level, is because this happened so very, very quickly. Suddenly, we thought there were programs, and suddenly, they were gone. And once they're gone, they are gone forever. And any other school system can tell you that. Now, in raising the money, I view this as an emergency and kind of last-ditch and extraordinary effort to buy us time to, in fact, become involved. And Penny, I can assure you that my vote at the next town council election and the next school board election are going to be very critical. And I'm sure that I will have my kids very much involved in the political process. And I fully agree that's appropriate. In fact, any educator would say the best school system is not the one that throws money at the problem, but the one that has involved parents. And that's what I guess is the, if you will, the hidden agenda in why I'm involved here, because I think we have started a modest grassroots effort to have parents become involved. You know, for those parents, those people that called you where children come home and say we have to provide money, you know, I personally apologize. I have never asked the kids to solicit money. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that spread word of mouth and one of the weaknesses of a grassroots effort. Things get misstated, papers get printed that shouldn't be. Um, I'm happy to work with the town manager or any member of the town uh, council or staff to come up with a mechanism to control the dollars. My view would be that these dollars, once that the checks would be made to the town of Cape Elizabeth, if that's not acceptable, we can come up with something else. Uh, but in time is almost too short to set up some kind of tax exempt. Uh, organization that can funnel these funds appropriately. Uh, the, you have a packet in front of you notes that, the, uh, that this is a conditional pledge designed only for the purpose of reinstoring these programs and cannot be used for anything else. Once one reason we pr propose pledges rather than money because what do we do with such a large amount of $16,000 let's say if we actually had that? That puts anyone involved at tremendous financial and personal risk certainly. Um, so we, ra we raised pledges until we could approach the town council in terms of coming up with a more suitable mechanism, essentially playing within the rules. Um, I think my philosophy on some of this uh, would be we have three opportunities in our lifetime to be activists. One, perhaps when we're young and perhaps in college or what have you, we can be active on the basis for humanity. We can, we can fight, we can, we can protest inequities and unfairness across the, uh, across the world. When we're middle-aged and we have children, we can be active on behalf of our children. And it's clear that as we become older and we become senior citizens, we are active on behalf of ourselves. Uh, I guess my interest right now is merely activism on the part of my children. And I'm certainly not trying to send them a message of throw money at the problem because that'll make it go away. I would fully agree that that is the worst solution. But because of the extraordinary nature and the timing of this, we had no choice. Uh, but to uh, attempt this effort. And if it fails, then we have learned something about ourselves as a town and what we're willing to spend for education. I personally am not prepared to give that up without at least a modest struggle. But I'm certainly interested in playing within the rules that the town council sets. If we can set some reasonable rules, it at least gives us the opportunity. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to participate in any way in terms of subject to any oversight or any, act you know, any action that I would take or, uh, as far as this fundraising goes. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If not, I would like the council to come to um, either make a motion on this item or have some discussion first and then a motion. Councilor Reed. Um, may I um, have some discussion, please, Madam Chairman? I would like to bring to um, the councilor's attention that in chapter. Um, 223, Michael, of the Municipal Finances, Section 30-1, subsection, I'm doing this wrong, I'm sorry, it's Section 5652, pertaining to donation of money. The municipal officers may accept a donation of money to the municipality to supplement a specific appropriation already made. Section 5654 cites conditional gifts, and that is how we are classifying these pledges. This section governs a municipality's receipt of a conditional gift for any specified public reason. Uh, there's other language in here, but under Title 20, Section A, sub 
Section 2352 of Educational Law. No money appropriated by law for public schools may be paid from the treasury of any municipality except upon written order of its municipal officers. No such order shall be drawn by the officers except upon presentation of a properly avouched bill of items. That bill of items having first been approved by a majority of the members of the school committee and certified by the superintendent of schools. That's tomorrow night's meeting. Relative to school administrative districts, and this language also applies to community schools, gifts may be accepted in the form of money or other property outright for any specified educational or benevolent reason. The school board must comply with the following in accepting gifts, which is not appropriate for this discussion. I would prefer to see the characterization of this money as other than precedent setting and a bad idea, I would rather see it deemed alternative funding for a school year 1990-91 as a means of saving a program that would otherwise be eliminated as an interim measure until the current budgetary concerns of taxpayers have been resolved without penalizing the students that have been affected by these changes. I would also like to draw your attention to Title 20-A, Section 1256, Subsection 7, which authorizes the school board to accept from public funds any specific educational, excuse me, to accept gifts from the public for any benevolent or educational reason. I do believe that in the law we do have the mechanism in which to solicit funds for education to the extent of $51,000 for Cape Elizabeth schools for class year 1990-91. Thank you. Councillor Creeman. The problem with this kind of issue is that if you're uh, not the last person to speak, you uh, risk uh, being the only one holding a particular position. I'm, you know, very saddened that we, uh, in this whole budgetary process this year, couldn't end up in a win-win situation. As a consequence, we lost a, uh, an important program, and from what I can hear, we lost uh, a superb teacher. It's an emotional issue that um, there has been a lot of rhetoric, there's been a lot of allegations, uh, there's certainly been uh, intense feeling it's also been a ping pong ball and it really has turned into a kind of a who's going to hold the the hot potato last um, is it going to be the town council or is it going to be the school board uh, i don't think charter wise this is the forum for this discussion i don't think this discussion should be happening here i think it should have happened at the school board I'm very concerned about prolonging this process uh, potentially to September 14th. Um, I hope uh, in responding to Mrs. Uh, Joyce that we will not go through this uh, every year. I do think that the uh, school board and the town council have worked as professionals. I think that authorizing this fundraiser is a band-aid approach and I don't think it's a good precedent. We have three fundraisers going on right now in Cape Elizabeth. We have a war memorial fundraiser that has just started looking for three and a half thousand dollars. We had a wet team fundraiser that my understanding is they never did get to their goal and we have a land trust purchase that to my understanding also uh, have not gotten to their goal. When I voted for the portables and pushed that issue, um, I hoped that we would be able to save home economics, the living skills course, and industrial arts in particular. We haven't been able to, and I can't uh, continue this process of uh, what has been, I think, uh, termed uh, bad-mouthing the school board, both in the press and in the, the various conversations that are going on uh, in the community, 
for the cuts that they've made because I can't find the $51,000 myself, uh, nor can any of the school board members, nor can specifically Charlie Greer, who was the uh, one of the four to one vote uh, himself, only being able to find possibly in the ballpark of $30,000. There are other figures that have been passed around. In my opinion, they're not official uh, and I can't uh, buy them. With all due respect to uh, Mrs. Ellis, again, to, for whom I hear is a superb teacher, I don't think that apathy and laziness have characterized uh, this process. As the newly designated finance chairman of the town council this evening, um, I hope that uh, in leading the finance committee in our deliberations with the school board over the next 12 months, uh, that the deliberations, as usual, will all be in public, uh, will be open, uh, and they will all proceed through the appropriate channels such that we will arrive at a common budget figure that will take into account school and municipal and community services and county uh, expenditures. Uh, I personally feel that the uh, most compassionate position uh, at this point in time, given this issue, uh, is to put the issue uh, at rest tonight, uh, and I am not inclined to authorize this fundraiser. Council Amaro. Uh, I guess I would say ditto to everything that Wayne just said, but before doing that, uh, I'd like to uh, compliment Mr. Bremer uh, in particular on his feeling of how important it is for parents to be involved in their children's education. I don't think there's anything that any of us as parents can do that is more important. And I applaud you for what you've done. Uh, you're right in line with what all of the studies in education say. When the parents are involved, uh, the, the kids do better. Uh, and in this community, I think we need to be really proud of that fact that parents are involved. However, having said that, uh, I do think that this approach to uh, funding a, uh, a teacher by raising funds privately is extremely inappropriate. Uh, I have served on the school board myself for six years and on this council for seven years. And I, in answer to uh, Mrs. Ellis's uh, remarks about this was an easy cut, I must tell you that I have never personally made a cut that's been easy. I don't think there are any easy cuts, whether you're sitting on the town council side or the school board side. Uh, people who serve in these positions uh, do not take the positions lightly. At least I, I have not seen anybody do that in Cape Elizabeth in my, during my long tenure on both boards. Uh, and I think both the town council this year, all of us as individuals and all of the individuals on the school board wrestled uh, for hours and days and weeks with the decisions that we had to make, and I don't think any of us took them lightly. Uh, as far as Councilor Jordan's recommendation that the school board and town council ought to sit down again on this matter, I think we've been through that process this year. I'm not, I, we can always improve communications between the town council and the school board, but I must tell you, uh, this past year, serving as president of the Greater Portland Council of Governments, I've had an opportunity to visit all of the communities uh, in Cumberland County, minus two or three of them, to visit their town councils, uh, to visit their, uh, their, their local elected officials in action. And I'll tell you, we have a community that we ought to be proud of because all of our elected officials take their jobs really seriously. They do their homework. And although I haven't liked all the decisions the school board has made, and I'm sure they haven't liked the, all the decisions that we've made as town councilors, the process is that we, we try as hard as we can to influence the voting before the voting vote is taken. But once a vote has been taken, I think we have to learn to lose gracefully too once in a while. And that's a really hard lesson for anybody to learn. Uh, as far as my vote tonight, I cannot vote to authorize this money for three reasons. First of all, I think it's absolutely inappropriate to fund a teaching position in this fashion. Secondly, it sets a precedent that will just never go away. Whenever any board in this town uh, makes a, uh, a cut in, in any budget, all that a group, will a special interest group will have to do is get together and try to raise the money uh, uh, to put that back into the budget because the precedent will have been set this year. Uh, and lastly, uh, 
there, one of the reasons that any group that wants to fundraise has to come before the town council is because we have to look at competing, uh, competing groups who want to be authorized to raise funds in this town. And right now we have a big campaign going on to raise money to, uh, for land acquisition. Uh, it's a very important fundraising campaign. They're having a hard time raising that money. Uh, the wet team had a hard time raising their money, as Council Creelman has already said. We are going to be launching another fundraising campaign within a few months uh, to, uh, to restore the, uh, uh, the lighthouse at Fort Williams. Uh, so we have to look at all of these competing interests. And, uh, and for that third reason, I am not going to vote tonight uh, to, go, uh, to go ahead with this fundraising project. Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you. I could quickly make my statements and say ditto to what Councillors Creelman and Amro have said. I have stated before that <coughs> I'm, at that point, I was the one counselor with a child in the middle school who would be directly affected next year. At this point, I may be alone in that capacity or not. Yes, my daughter was planning to take home ec next year. She took home ec this year. And it's a course that she totally enjoys. I am a retired teacher. I know the importance of hands-on courses for children throughout their learning experience, especially in the middle school ages, where it's relief for them to get out of the academic classroom into a classroom where they can see immediate results, be they good or bad, whatever, from their experiences in the living skills. I think it's a very valuable course. Overriding that is the value of the democratic process. I do have two children. I will assure you that there has been a lot of civics lessons in our home. I can assure you that when I talk to the high school civics classes, hopefully I'll be invited next year, that we will talk more about the budget issues and the policies that are set during budget issues. Those are some of the important, other important educational lessons for the children in this community and hopefully for the rest of us adults in the community. This kind of proposed funding, in my opinion, is a very serious undermining of the representative process. You take away the accountability of your elected officials. I'm not willing to let that happen. As Jane said, we need to look at the budget process in its entirety. Yes, I very strongly disagree with some of the actions the school board has taken, but I will very strongly support the fact that those are the representatives who are elected to make those decisions. I know there's one school board member who calls it the comedy. It's C-O-M-I-T-Y, and you're right, Peter, I had to look it up. <laughs> um, that's what I refer to when I say I will support the fact that they made their best decision at the time. We don't have to agree with it. I, as a parent, don't have to agree with it, and I've had discussions with school board members wearing my parent hat. That's appropriate. I think this approach is very myopic, and I'm not willing to do that to the town and to the process. Other comments? <laughs> Madam Chairman, uh, when I decided to run for town council, uh, one of the apprehensions was getting involved in the budget. I was assured that this first year they don't throw you right into it. <laughs> and they all laugh because that's right where we are. Uh, and, you know, I, I am perplexed by what's been said in all counts, uh, by Jane Ellis, by Penelope, uh, by Mr. Bremer. But once again, I don't want to see this precedent set for fundraising for special programs. I won't say special interest because I don't like special interest in the big political picture. But I keep on thinking of one of the courses I took in advertising, which said that we can get the children out there today are prone to be victims by advertisers for what they call instant gratification. And that's what money does. That's what marketing towards them does. 
and I think that this is basically an advertising campaign that is targeted towards instant gratification. I agree with Mr. Uh, Counselor Jordan that there's got to be some other measure, but I don't want to go with a stopgap saying, all right, let's raise the money and then that'll buy us time. You've given in to the procedure of the process, which has already been decided. Uh, without babbling on and on, I'll just say that I'm, I'm not for and I will not vote in favor of authorizing uh, fundraising for this issue, but I would hope that in the future the public hearings that are held by the school board and the town council are better attended at the beginning and not at the last when it's already been decided and it's already been hashed over time and time again. And I can guarantee you that next year I will personally go knock on doors before the budget hearing and say we've got a public hearing coming tonight. Not that last one that says the budget's going to be decided tonight, because that's something you've got to get involved in at the beginning, not the end. Thank you. I'd like a motion on this item, please. You wouldn't allow me to speak Would you like more? one more yes. time, Mr. Of course. I just want to say that it's been interesting in what I've heard here, and who gets hurt but the children that's going to school? They're the ones that get hurt. Here we are. We can authorize a fundraising to buy a boat. We can authorize fundraising to, to change the war memorial. We can authorize a fundraising for a lighthouse. Numerous other things, but when a group of people want to come in and save a program within the school system, I don't understand why, and it's to have betterment of your children, and I don't understand why it doesn't get supported. I just, I just can't see it. And there's one thing I'd like to say and pass on to our Madam Chairman, that you start tomorrow, next week, or next month, communicate with the school board so we aren't down to the wire, like Councilor Pearson just said, in adopting a budget, that it's done through the year, and we have communications through the year and see if we can't solve this problem because all I've heard, next year's going to be worse than this year, and if that's the case, we'll let Wells Road go without a striping, or we'll let something else go and let the kids get their education. <laughs> and I'm a grandfather, and I don't have to worry about my own children, just my grandchildren. I have one left, and he's going into the high school, so I'm not here just because I have a child or a grandchild in the elementary school system. I'd like a motion, please, on this item. Nobody wants to make a motion? I'll make a motion <laughs> that we grant this. We, we grant and authorize the fundraising for the school for $51,000 to reinstate the programs, which was cut by the school board. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor of this motion will take a roll call vote. Chairman Cogsall? No. Council Jordan? Yes. Council Amaro? No. Council Creelman? No. Council McLaughlin? No. Councilor Pearson? No. Councilor Reed? Yes. Two yes and five no. The next item on the agenda is number 15, to consider a proposed amendment to the personnel code. <coughs> At this time, do you want to go back? Might as well. Yeah. Council would you like a five minute break? Sure. All right, we'll have a five minute break, please. All that coffee you nice too. Usually, usually yeah. the first meeting, the chairman is shaking. What? We did well, Carl. The first question you asked, you've got to get that right away from the right. <laughs>
The mic might be on. Yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. To postpone it, yeah. So it has to be executive session. Yep. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't feel good. Can we not get that? Not on your first meeting. You say so. The next item on the agenda, item 15, to consider a proposed amendment to the personnel code and taking any necessary action. Well, actually, I was the chairman of the Ordinance Committee, but uh, for, for my last official uh, presentation here, uh, very briefly, <clears throat> the Maine Legislature adopted a revised manufactured housing and mobile home park law during the 1989 legislative session, which required uh, all of Maine communities to undertake two major tasks by January 1st, 1990. The first was to designate areas within the town that permit mobile home parks to expand and to be developed in a number of environmentally suitable locations in the municipality, and secondly, to enact the performance standards pertaining to mobile home parks detailed in the new law. And it should be noted that the state law gives communities little latitude in the performance standards that can be applied to uh, mobile uh, home parks. The new ordinance language uh, that has been proposed covers the following. It allows individual manufactured housing units to continue to be located within both the RA and RC districts. It allows manufactured housing parks to be located only within the RC district. It sets the state mandated minimum lot area standards which range from six and a half thousand square feet for park lots served by public sewer to 20,000 square feet for park lots with individual subsurface wastewater disposal systems. It provides for open space dedication and buffering were allowed by the state law. And uh, lastly, it requires groundwater assessment studies for manufactured housing parks not served by public water uh, or public sewer systems. These uh, above mentioned items are just a few of the many areas covered uh, by the proposed ordinance language. As the viewers may remember, we first passed an emergency ordinance regarding uh, the proposed manufactured housing park ordinance provisions back on January 8th, 1990, uh, where we approved with a unanimous vote the 90-day uh, extension on an emergency basis. We then on April 9th uh, reenacted the emergency ordinance for another 90-day uh, extension and this evening, uh, we hopefully are going to adopt this uh, particular proposed uh, manufactured housing park ordinance uh, provisions to uh, our ordinance code. So without any further complicating of the roughly six page uh, document, I'm going to uh, defer to our town planner, Mr. Butler, to give some of his uh, summary statements on the ordinance, if that uh, suits uh, Madam Chairman. Fine. Okay, Councillor 
Creelman did a good job of going over the, the highlights. I think two issues that came up that were, um, were addressed in the, most, in the latest draft of the ordinance before you. One deals with the, uh, on, be on page two, on lots served by public sewer, the minimum, minimum lot width. And there was a question as to whether or not in some situations um, with that minimum width, whether or not a, a manufactured housing unit could actually be placed on a lot. And it turns out there were some situations where indeed um, the lot could not be created. So we changed that from 50 feet to 60 feet, which is, which is a, a change that was been made, uh, has been made. I think the only other, there are several other changes that were made part of the, the ordinance committee draft number one that you have before you. Uh, many of them were very minor in nature and, and, which, and they involved things such as spelling changes and the rest. One other issue that did, was raised by, um, I believe it was the council, regarding whether or not the uh, ordinance, both the subdivision and the zoning ordinances should have a definition dealing with manufactured housing subdivisions or developments. And after much discussion um, with the town attorney, it was felt that adding that it was felt that the existing definitions that are proposed to be added to the two ordinances are sufficient and that if we considered, the town considered adding an additional definition, it might raise more problems and questions than it would answer. So based on that, it was felt to go with the definitions the way they were left off. So those, I think, are the, some of the major changes. If you have any specific questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Let me just make one clarification. Uh, the, uh, the ordinance tonight the intent is to uh, set a public hearing for July 9th, our next council meeting. There would, there would be no, en no enactment uh, this evening. The emergency 90-day uh, provision would carry us through the July 9th, uh, 1990 council meeting for uh, hopeful uh, enactment at that point. Are there any questions of uh, Mr. Butler? Any comments? It was with great difficulty that the Ordinance Committee had to enact an ordinance that was practically written for them by someone else. Um, it's sort of, I know there are several towns that are protesting the fact that they're losing their right of um, self-government by being forced to accept an ordinance that is so um, clearly, so tightly written. Um, I'll take a motion on this item. I would move, Madam Chairman, to uh, set a public hearing on July 9th, 1990, um, at our July Town Council meeting uh, to consider adoption of the proposed manufactured housing park ordinance provisions. I'll second that with 7.30 p.m. at the Town Hall. Add it to the motion. Thank you. Mr. Jordan? Any discussion? Those in favor of setting this for public hearing in July? Raise your hand. 7-0. Item number 17, to consider a zone change request from RA to BA in the vicinity of Jonesy service station and take any necessary action. You, you have in your packet uh, a proposed zone change that comes recommended unanimously by the planning board. Uh, there is a map that shows the specific area. It's uh, on Route 77, uh, next Ocean House Road, uh, next to Jonesy's as you approach the uh, the uh, Methodist Church. I was trying to think if it had another name, but it is the Cape Elizabeth Methodist Church. Uh, <coughs> Steve Butler is here. If you have any questions on the planning board deliberations, and Greg Jones of uh, Jonesy Service Station is here as well. Any questions? Council McLaughlin. I have some questions of Mr. Butler. Yes. Um, as I'm continuing to acquaint myself with the town's ordinances. The way I'm reading the ordinances, we need from the planning board a recommendation about the land use implications of this proposal. I have not yet seen the minutes of the May 15th meeting of the planning board, but I will assume that we will receive those minutes before um, this is discussed in public hearing next month and we'll have that kind of reasoning available. Yes, right now the minutes are in draft form only and they'll be made available to you, uh, I think, both in draft form and also in the final approved form. Okay. And that'll happen at the next planning board meeting next Tuesday. And there is that kind of reasoning going to be put forth? Yes. Okay. I'm wondering if the expansion plans 
that would go along with this um, zoning expansion would have to go to the zoning board? The zoning board has already heard, um, this matter has already been before the zoning board and it's received approval. So, and so from the zoning board, it's then went to the planning board on two issues, one the zone change request and then also the site plan review um, process and it's still going site plan review. Okay. My final question would be, what procedures would the applicant have to follow if it wants to install car washing facilities in the future? Would that go back to the plant, go to before the planning board for review? I'm especially concerned about the impact on the sewer, if mm -hmm. that exists. If, if there's any change from the current plan or the plan is, is approved, if it is approved by the uh, planning board uh, regarding the proposed site plan, it would have to indeed go back before the planning board for further site plan review. So any change from what currently is being proposed would indeed be reviewed again by the planning board, not by the town council. I would add that one of the slight changes that was approved tonight for the comprehensive plan was to allow the expansion of existing businesses in the business districts in the town center. And I think, you know, I at this point am tending to view this favorably. Thank you. Any other comments from other councilors? Councilor Amaral. Uh, just a question. Uh, have you heard from any of the neighbors or abutters? We haven't. It's um, been before the zoning board. There was a public hearing the, um, before them. I don't believe there are any neighbors that came out. Planning board had a public hearing on the zone change. Um, no, you know, no public came out either at the public hearing or, or submitted anything in writing. We we're going to be advertising. We have advertised another public hearing on the site plan review because there's some concern on the part of the planning board that in the planning board's notices that people didn't know that. Uh, under considera consideration was a canopy and some additional parking. So again, we'll have one more time at the planning board level um, to try and solicit some public comment. But up to this point in time, there have been no public that have come out to my knowledge. Councilor Creelman. I just have a comment. Um, you know, just as I'm not in favor in general in voting on issues where we're presented with information right at the moment of the council meeting, I also think that it's a, a real disadvantage to not uh, have even the draft uh, notes of the May 15th planning board to have these kind of questions about abutters and you know uh, problems and uh, you know, the fact that the site plan review is still pending. Um, we really are at a disadvantage, and and if items are going to be on the agenda, you know rather than having to hunt down chairmen's of uh, the planning board, whoever they are. Uh, it would be nice to have those uh, minutes at least in a, in a draft fashion to, to answer some of these questions that are being asked this evening. Okay. Comments from anyone else? Um, I'm sorry to make a motion. Oh, I just went, had one question, Mr. Butler. We have um, a Main Street 90 committee, and there is a subcommittee that is involving the town center. Mm -hmm. Have they at any time had any, any input in this process? Did they go at the time of the hearing at the zoning board or at the planning board? Um, I know from the planning board's perspective that uh, the applicant, Greg Jones, was advised to have contact with the Main Street 90 subcommittee, the town center subcommittee, and he talked with the uh, chairman of the subcommittee, Henry Adams, and they discussed the plans and, and came up with uh, um, plans that seemed to be suitable to that subcommittee. And are these the plans that basically are being presented to the planning board now for final approval? I are there any adjustments I after talking with that committee? I believe the plans that you have in your packets are the same. Mr. Jones has submitted some subsequent um, pieces of information based on the site plan, but I think in terms of the, the buffering, the main issue was the plantings, the grassing of the I island areas and the two site areas that would be expanded. Um, and then the uh, use of planters, uh, of barrel-like planters to um, hold annual-type flowers, um, those I think are the same as the And those reflect the you. discussions with the Main Street 90 Committee. Right. Madam Chairman, I move that we set to public hearing at 7.30 p.m. on Monday, July 9th, 1990, in Council Chambers at Town Hall, the zone change request from RA to BA <laughs> in the vicinity of Jonesy Service Station. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. 7-0. Next item on the agenda. 
Item 18, to consider approving a new lease for the daycare center at Fort Williams Park and take any necessary action. Mr. McGovern, would you give us background, please? Yes, as I notified you at a meeting a little while ago, I think it was the last month or the month before, the Lighthouse Daycare operated by the Church of the Nazarene uh, planned not to renew their lease uh, effective uh, July 1. Uh, when word of that uh, became known, there was a tremendous amount of concern expressed particularly by the current parents that it may not continue as a daycare center. Uh, in addition to that, I was quite concerned, uh, I know back when these buildings were empty a few years ago, we had a real tough time leasing them because of the, the restricted uses of them. And I was particularly nervous with this year's uh, e economy and uh, there's a real glut of uh, office space. And so fortunately, lo and behold, uh, who stepped forward but Jillian Slagle, who is the uh, current uh, manager of the, of the daycare center, along with uh, Karen Barrasso, and uh, they very much would like to operate the daycare center, uh, much as it has been operated in the past with a slightly different name, uh, the Fort Williams Preschool, Preschool and Child Care Center. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, present this uh, lease to you uh, for approval. It is the same lease amount. Uh, as the current year and otherwise uh, the provisions are the same. Uh, both Jillian uh, Slagle and Karen Barrasso are, uh, are here tonight uh, should you have any questions. I also apologize to them for the lateness of putting this on the agenda at the end. Councilman Perlman. I just have one question, Michael, on the lease. Uh, July 1st, 1990 through June 30th, 1991 is 12 months. Why is it 13 months? Or am I counting something? Because out? because last year the lease was 13 months, and when we when we went to change everything, that's something we missed. Oh, uh, oh excellent okay. point. Okay. Is it still for 13 months? No, it's for 12. 12. The last lease ran from June 1 to June 30 of the following year, so it should okay. be 12 months. The dates are right. The the reference to the number of months is incorrect. I thought we could pick up an extra $600. <laughs> Jordan. That, was, that was my comment that I didn't quite see how we got 13 months out of the 12th, July 1st to June 30th. But I want to uh, commend the manager for picking up a new tenant for the buildings in the fort and also the people that want to run a daycare center. I understand that around the community it's something that is needed and I feel it would, should go forward, and I have no problems with the language of the lease because, I, like you say, it's pretty much the same as the previous one. So I'll make a motion that we do grant a lease. Second. You Any want discussion? Me to for Daycare Center and Fort Williams Park. Same second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, raise your hand. Seven zero. Congratulations, we're just delighted to have you. Then we have a new item. <laughs> <laughs> we're all talked about. <laughs> item 18A, which is a new requirement by the state that we officially accept state funds. Michael, would you like to uh, give us background on that, please? Yes, you have before you in your packet a, a memo that I don't see in front of me, but I think it's headed with some main municipal stationery. And this is another one of those lo and beholds. Uh, the state came up with uh, another new mandate, and that's that we have to accept uh, all these categories of funds. So I would uh, encourage uh, someone to uh, authorize that items uh, 1 through 10 uh, on this list uh, be authorized uh, for acceptance uh, along with uh, one additional one uh, s spelling out uh, state park uh, subsidy. Where'd, we, the, where'd that list come from? I didn't see it. This one? It was attached to this MMA thing. Went out on Friday. Friday? Is there someone who would like to have any questions, the manager? Councilor Amaro. Uh, we've already accept, um, we've already voted on some of these items, but you just you're gonna lump them all together and we'll vote again on some of them. I think that's what they want, Mrs. Amaro. 
Would someone like to make a motion to that effect? We'll move. Second. Can't find it, but I'll Any, <laughs> any more discussion? <laughs> all those in favor, raise your hand, please. Okay, we officially accept all the funds that the state wants to give us and some they may not want to. It's a pretty broad statement. The they, want to, they want to give it to us. We'll take it. And then some, yes. We're at our final um, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Are there any citizens who would like to come forward and make a comment at this time? Mr. Capano's out there. He must have some. Yeah, I, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I just, on behalf of the staff, I, I didn't want to mention anything at the beginning of the meeting because the flow uh, was a little bit off, but I wanted to uh, thank Bill Jordan for uh, his, his excellent leadership during this past year. Uh, uh, whenever anyone on the staff ever needed to get a hold of him, uh, he, he always, uh, if, he, if he was not there, uh, he was always quick to return phone calls. He was always extremely receptive and as well as extremely perceptive. Uh, in dealing with, with any issue that, that came forward. Uh, there, there's an old joke somewhat in the fire department, and I remember some old cartoons, and when you, when you tried to reach Bill Jordan, uh, they always said that he was outstanding in his field. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and, you know, not only in the field of agriculture, but I think also when, uh, as the chairman of this town council, he uh, is outstanding in his field. And, I really want to thank him for his leadership this past year and uh, appreciate all that he did. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. If there are no citizens who'd like to come forward, Janet. Janet? Excuse me, Madam Chairman. Excuse are we me. expecting to consider taking action on the Lions Club donations this evening? Now, I was going to put that as an item on the next time around. Next. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I just got one thing I'd like to say that I did on my last week of chairmanship and I hope you all approve it. I sent a letter to the state thanking them for what they've done as far as paving Spelling Avenue and connecting the bikeway from Scarborough to the Spelling Church and uh, I thought it when I talked it over the manager I thought it might be appropriate to kind of respond to some things like that with people and maybe uh, Next time around, they will remember you. So I just want to. <laughs> yes. We sent one to uh, Bracket over in Scarborough and also a copy to the Commissioner, Dana Connors. Very nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Item number 19 to consider in executive session a request for a hardship abatement and the discussion of proposed amendments to the personnel code. Councilor Amaro. Madam Chairman, I move we go into executive session to discuss those two items. Second. Second. All those in favor? Second zero. And we will go to the conference room. To the conference room. No action. Do I need to bring my papers? No. We have this back. Do you want the cameras? 